agents in microbial control. They can be liquids, gases, or solids. They include agents such as disinfectants, antiseptics, sterilants, and preservatives. So two terms that you need to know. Aqueous solution is something that will dissolve in water. Aqueous, agua, it means water. Salt dissolves in water, as an example. Tinctures are a bit different because the chemical will not dissolve in water. You have to suspend it in either pure alcohol or a water alcohol mixture that will actually allow it to dissolve and become part of the fluid. Chemical agents vary in how concentrated they are as well as how fast they work. It also depends on the other factors that are listed in the next slide. Let's see. Doo -doo -doo. So table nine, eight. Chlorine. It's a halogen. It can be liquid or gas. And you can also have hypochlorites, which would be bleach. So how does it work? It actually denatures the enzymes or proteins in the cell and that suspends any metabolic reactions because in order to do metabolism, you have to have enzymes. And if you've destroyed the enzymes, it's not going to work. This can disinfect drinking water, sewage, and wastewater. You can use it to disinfect toys, bedding, instruments, food, food equipment, and recreational waters. Everybody knows that you go to a swimming pool and it smells like chlorine. The limitation with chlorine, it is less effective if excess organic matter is present or if exposed to an alkaline or basic pH or light. The bottle for bleach, if you'll notice, is a solid white color. It isn't clear. One of the reasons for that is because exposure to overhead light or sun or whatever actually denatures the chlorine. It actually breaks it up. So we put it in these solid bottles so that it lasts longer. Now, is it forever? Probably not, it's a white bottle. It's not like it's a brown amber bottle or a black bottle, but it does give it a longer shelf life. Iodine is also a halogen. Free iodine in solution, monkey blood. Uh, iodophores, this is actually a complex of iodine and alcohol. So betadine is a good example of that, where it's suspended in alcohol. So what does it do? It interferes with metabolic functions and bonding of proteins. Proteins have to, some proteins have to bind to specific things for them to work properly. We talked about coenzymes before. Others in order to metabolize, in order to break stuff apart, they actually have to be able to grab a hold of it and break it. Well, if, if it interrupts that, then all of a sudden you're not breaking things apart that you maybe should be. It can be used as an antiseptic for the skin. Betadine is very commonly used before surgery. Wherever the surgical site is, they'll basically run betadine all over it. And it can be used as a disinfectant for smaller instruments. The limitation with iodine, it can really irritate the skin, especially if you're highly sensitive to it. The iodophore, where it's actually an alcohol, is less irritating than just free iodine. Hydrogen peroxide, I'm sure everybody knows what that is, brown bottle. It forms toxic free radicals of oxygen that can be harmful to the cells if they don't have a specific enzyme to get rid of it. It can be antiseptic for the skin. It can be helped to sterilize delicate instruments in combination with low temperatures. Hydrogen peroxide, it's not as corrosive as other things. That's the best way I can think to put it. So if you have very sensitive instruments that you're using, let's say in surgery or things like that, you can soak them in hydrogen peroxide and it's not gonna damage them, which is beneficial. Now, the limitation with hydrogen peroxide, 
It will only be sporicidal. It'll only kill spores at very high concentrations. And hydrogen peroxide at high concentrations can actually be fairly dangerous. So you gotta be careful. Aldehydes, aldehydes. Glutaraldehyde and formaldehyde, they actually disrupt both protein and enzyme activity. They can be used to sterilize equipment and instruments. What's the limitation? That right there. They are extremely toxic. They used to preserve specimens that we would dissect in formaldehyde. Actually, before I started school, they used to do that. And they figured out pretty quick that formaldehyde was a carcinogen. That was one. And it was toxic. It wasn't like you could just, you know, dissect an animal without having something on your hands, without having consequences after. Gaseous sterilants and disinfectants. So you've got ethyl, um, ethylene oxide and chlorine dioxide. They block DNA replication and enzymatic actions. These are really good for disinfecting plastics and delicate materials. You can form it into a gas in a chamber and the things that are left in that chamber get disinfected very well. What's the, the limitation? Ethylene oxide is explosive, that's one. And for us, it's toxic to our lungs, eyes, and mucous membranes. In addition to that, it's also a carcinogen. It's a cancer-causing agent. So yeah, limit. Phenolic, examples, um, triclosan. It disrupts cell walls, cell membranes, and proteins. It's a good disinfectant for surfaces, but it can't be used as an antiseptic because it is toxic. Chlorhexidine is what is usually found in mouthwashes and hand scrubs. It disrupts the plasma membranes and denatures the proteins. Antiseptic hand scrubs and mouthwashes, like I said, is where you kind of find them or find chlorhexidine. While it's good with microbes, viruses, and fungi, it's kind of iffy as to whether or not they'll work. It depends on which virus and which fungi you're talking about. Alcohol, that includes ethyl alcohol or isopropyl. Isopropyl is the one you're probably the most familiar with, with rubbing alcohol. Ethyl is the one that you find in drinking alcohol, like beer and vodka and things like that. It actually does disrupt the membrane activity of uh, the cell. They can be used as a de-germing agent and also as antiseptics. They can be used in mouthwashes and hand sanitizers. And I'm sure with the pandemic, you know about hand sanitizers and alcohol. For a while there, there was, you know, the don't drink the hand sanitizer because the alcohol they were using wasn't ethanol, it was methanol. Methanol causes blindness. <laughs> You drink a little bit of methanol, which is a wood type alcohol, and you go blind. So yeah, you've got to you've got to be careful because not all of the alcohols are the same. What's the limitation with alcohol? As you probably already know, alcohol evaporates really fast, which means that it doesn't sit on the thing that you're trying to disinfect for that long. If you soak it in it in an airtight container, different story. But if you're talking about taking alcohol and just, it evaporates off your hands pretty fast. So you might be going, okay, well, what about hand sanitizer? We use, think about the consistency of a hand sanitizer. It's gel-like. It doesn't evaporate right away. It's pretty quick, but it's not like instantaneous. That combination that they have in hand sanitizer means the alcohol sits on your hands for a longer period of time. Detergents, quats, also called surfactants. They disrupt the cell membrane. Disinfectants, sanit sanitation, um, sanitization, um, agents of surfaces and kitchen utensils. What's the limitation with dishwashing soap? It's not sporicidal or um, tuberculocidal. 
So if tuberculosis is around, it's not really gonna do anything. Heavy metal compounds like mercury and silver also inactivate proteins and can be used as antiseptics, but they are not sporicidal. So spores could still be there. And the other thing is, especially with mercury, it is very toxic. It will, it, it, it will poison you and kill you. So they're not used necessarily around humans as a way to help them in antiseptic technique or anything like that. Antimicrobial therapies. Now we're talking antibiotics and antivirals. In patient care, we use a variety of antimicrobial therapy or chemotherapy, chemical therapy, to treat infectious disease. Antimicrobial therapy has greatly reduced the number of deaths from certain infectious diseases. Not all of them, but certain ones. But the overuse of antibiotics could be leading to resistance, which could leave humans susceptible to diseases which were once controllable. So, Chemotherapeutic drugs. This is an important table to know these things. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Chemotherapeutic drugs are any chemical used in the treatment, relief, or prophylaxis of a disease. Prophylaxis would be prevention. Prophylaxis is the use of a drug to prevent an imminent infection of a person at risk. You can kind of think of a vaccine as a prophylaxis. We aren't giving you the disease, but we're trying to get your immune system ready before it can get into your body. Now, does this mean you won't get sick at all? No, but it does mean that if you do get sick, it'll be less severe because your immune system kind of already has a head start. Antimicrobial chemotherapy, the use of chemotherapeutic drugs to control an infection. Antimicrobials, it's an all-inclusive term for any antimicrobial drug regardless of where it comes from. Antibiotics are substances produced by natural metabolic processes of some microorganisms that can inhibit or destroy other microorganisms. Penicillin was found because a fungus had gotten on a plate and around that fungus was a clear area where the bacteria were growing. Turned out that fungus had an antibiotic against that bacteria and voila, penicillin was found, and then used. Semi-synthetic drugs are drugs that are chemically modified in the laboratory after being isolated from nat natural sources. So semi-synthetic, that means we're copying something that actually exists in nature. It's semi-synthetic because we're making it, but it's only kind of because we actually got it from a natural place. Synthetic drugs are drugs produced entirely by chemical reactions. Narrow-spectrum antibiotics, broad-spectrum antibiotics. Narrow-spectrum are effective against basically a small window or a limited array of microbial types. For example, a drug effective mainly against gram-positive bacteria. That's a pretty narrow window. Broad-spectrum are going to be effective against a wide variety of microbial types. For example, if I have a drug type that's effective against both gram positive and gram negative, I just made my window a lot bigger. Broad spectrum antibiotics are used a lot of times when they can't figure out what you're sick with. If they know it's bacterial, but they can't figure out what it is, they'll give you broad spectrum antibiotics because Maybe it's more than one bacteria, maybe it's, but a broad spectrum kind of puts you under a large umbrella that hopefully will kill anything that's inside of you. Five main mechanisms of action for the antimicrobial drugs include the inhibition of the cell walls synthesis, inhibition of nucleic acid structure and function, inhibition of protein synthesis, interference with the cell membrane, and inhibition of folic acid synthesis. Erythromycin, clindamycin, um, these actually act on the ribosomes and inhibit protein synthesis, specifically on the bigger of the two subunits. For 
the 30S, again, still inhibiting protein synthesis, we're talking about aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, glycyclocyclines, no, glycylcyclines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But all of these medications are going to be acting on a ribosome in a bacterial cell. The one that actually affects both is this drug right here. Folic acid synthesis in the cytoplasm. Folic acid is really important for metabolism. So if I block its synthesis, I'm blocking the cell's ability to do metabolism, to break stuff down, to make its own energy and things like that. So sulfonamides, the sulfa drugs, are an example of something that actually does that. The cell wall inhibitors, they block the synthesis and repair of that cell wall. So you've got penicillins, cephalosporins, um, vancomycin, vaxitracin, isoniazid. These are all medications that actually attack a target that isn't in us, which is somewhat beneficial. When we talk about attack of the cell membranes, we're talking about polymyxins, um, dapomycin. They, as you saw in, in the detergents uh, figure, basically poke holes into the cell membrane, meaning that anything can get in and anything can get out. There's no selectivity anymore. Things that attack the DNA and RNA, they inhibit the replication and transcription and inhibit gyrase, which is in bacteria, the unwinding enzyme. Remember I talked about you have to unwind the DNA so that it's not a big tangle. Quinolones do this. Um, those that inhibit RNA polymerase include rifampin. Now remember, polymerase means to build, so RNA polymerase is building RNA. That means I can't make mRNA, I can't make tRNA, I can't make rRNA. Rifampin definitely goes after those things. One of the things with antibiotics that we want to take advantage of, there are things in bacterial cells that we don't have. The example up there is the cell wall. Well, actually, there are two examples because there's also the ribosome that is different than our ribosome. So if we can use medications that are attacking things that are unique to a bacteria or a microbe, that's beneficial to us because if it's attacking a cell wall, I don't have one of those. The side effects that we see, diarrhea, upset stomach, things like that, are usually because the bacteria that we have that are symbiotes with us, that live within us normally, are also getting attacked by those antibiotics. And those bacteria do things for us. So when we kill them, we don't feel so well because the things that are normally being done by those bacteria are now not being done at all. The types of antibiotics, antibacterials, just kind of a small sampling. Isoniazid works against mycolic acids in the cell walls of mycobacteria. Um, streptomycin is an antibiotic in a group of aminoglycosides. It targets protein synthesis by affecting the 30S subunit of the microbial ribosome. ribosome. Polymycin targets the membrane phospholipids, carpen, carbapenems, penicillins, and cyclosporins. These um, inhibit the cell wall synthesis by interfering with peptidoglycan synthesis. Remember, cell walls, peptidoglycan. Tetracyclines interfere with protein synthesis by blocking the attachment of the tRNA to the microbial ribosome. Remember, tRNA is hauling the amino acid that's needed. If it can't get there, I can't make a protein. Sulfonamides interfere with the synthesis of folic acid. Again, something that is important. The spectrum of activity for antibiotics. You cannot give somebody an antibiotic that doesn't work on the specific bacteria that they are infected with because it would be useless. For example, polymycin, salmonellosis, plague, gonorrhea. 
gram-negative bacteria, and it is a very small window. Somebody has tuberculosis and they get polymycin, it's not going to do anything. Same with strep throat, staph infections. This is actually a bigger table in your book. So look it up in your book because you've got a lot, a lot more information here as far as things that can be treated. Um, tetracyclines, if you look at, it's even cut off. This actually can work on gram-negative bacteria, gram-positive bacteria, whatever is here that I can't see right now. The thing is, when we talk about broad spectrum, tetracyclines could be considered broad spectrum because they treat multiple things. Polymycin, not very narrow spectrum. It literally only treats gram-negative bacteria and probably only specific types of gram-negative bacteria. 